My name is Tanya Cantlow, and I'm the acting counsel to the borough president. To my right, I have e Ina Gusenfeld, who is the land use coordinator. And to my left, I have Richard Barrick, who is the director of land use. There are four items on the agenda this evening. Please note that this hearing is being recorded to comply with the public law for transparency. It will be available for viewing on Borough President Adams' website, brooklyn-usa.org, or on the One Brooklyn channel on YouTube. Again, web viewers may submit timely comments to Ask Eric at brooklynbp.nyc.gov for Borough President Adams' consideration. Please call the first item and let us begin. Calendar item number 1200106HAK. This application submitted by the New York City Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development, pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law of New York State, to designate three properties at 1559-1563 Prospect Place as an urban development action area and an urban development action area project and pursuant to section 197-C of the New York City Charter for the disposition of this site to a developer selected by HPD. Such actions would facilitate the development of an eight-story building with approximately 44 affordable housing units with a percentage reserved for the formerly homeless in Brooklyn Community District 8. Community Board 8 will vote on this application on December 12, 2019. Borough President Adams will hold off on making any decisions until he hears from the board. Would Makita Marshall Nesmith, the representative for this application, please state your name for the record and present the application. Hi, good evening everyone. My name is Makita Marshall Nesmith and I am a Brooklyn planner with the Office of Neighborhood Strategies at HPD. Um, with me today, I have Lynn Zing, the Director of Brooklyn Planning, and members from the sponsor team who will introduce themselves. Um, tonight, we would like to share with you an exciting project, Weeksville and CP at Prospect Place, which will bring quality affordable housing to Brooklyn, New York. Uh, HPD is requesting disposition of three city-owned li lots for the development of one new construction building under the HPD New Construction Program, or NCP. NCP funds new construction of infill rental housing with up to 45 units of affordable to low, moderate, and middle income households. The proposed project was selected through the NIHOP and NCP requests for qualifications, RFQ, which was released, on December 20, released in December 2014. The RFQ's goal was to create the development of home ownership and rental opportunities through small homes and mid-sized rental buildings. Under the RFQ, Settlement Housing Fund and Beachwood were chosen in February 2018. The proposed project will result in a total of 45 units, including a super unit with a mix of studios, ones, twos, bedrooms, and all affordable to households and individuals up to 80% of the AMI. The proposed project was certified on October 28th, and HPD is requesting the following actions for these three city-owned sites. Designation of an urban development action area, project approval of an urban development action area project, and disposition approval of the city-owned property. Weeksville NCP at Prospect Place is a development site comprised of three vacant city-owned lots in the Weeksville neighborhood of Brooklyn Community District 8 and City Council District 41. The development site is currently 8,342 square feet of unimproved vacant land. Now I will turn the presentation over to the development team to provide details to the, pro details to the proposed Weeksville NCP at Prospect Place project. I'm Judy Herbstman. I'm the Director of Housing Development at Settlement Housing Fund. Settlement Housing Fund is the lead developer, um, and we are a 50-year-old nonprofit. We develop affordable housing throughout Manhattan, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. We own currently about 2,000 units and have developed 8,700 units over our tenure. Um, and this is exactly our bread and butter. We like to do projects that have a mix of incomes and also formerly homeless. 
I'll turn it over now to our co-developer, Beachwood. Hi, I'm Chris Gonzalez, uh, representing Beachwood. You we can are. Mic, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chris Gonzalez, uh, representing Beachwood. Uh, we are the co-developer and GC on this project. Uh, we uh, are uh, a builder, developer, uh, with uh, communities across New York City and Long Island. Uh, our primary uh, project in New York City is Arvin by the Sea, uh, which a lot of people know. Um, and um, we're happy to team up with uh, Settlement on this great project. <laughs> Nikita spoke a bit about the site. Um, it's in the Weeksville area of Crown Heights. Um, it's on Prospect Place between Ralph and Buffalo Avenues. Um, it's currently zoned R6, and our proposal is compliant with that zoning. Um, the immediate area is mostly residential, though there are some community facility and institutional uses. Um, and the Weeksville Heritage Center is about uh, kind of a quarter block around. Um, we also have existing projects two blocks south. Um, so Settlement Housing Fund has a family homeless shelter and also two permanent housing developments just a few blocks south of there. This is the proposed rendering. Um, you can see that it's an eight-story building. Um, we've been talking that it's the 45 units. It's 22 studios, eight one-bedrooms, and 15 two-bedrooms. And now I'll turn it over to our architect to talk more about the design. Good evening. My name is Fialka Semenyuk. I'm with ESKW Architects. Uh, we were founded back in the 1960s and have a long history with affordable housing and also a long relationship with Settlement Housing Fund. Our first project with them being in the 1970s. So we're very happy to team up again uh, with this development team. Just a few more words on the proposed building, the rendering that we see. Um, it's the street presence is comprised of two parts. Uh, you can see a taller uh, brick mass which anchors the whole building to to the earth from that emerges a more lightweight volume that is clad in the gray cement board cladding uh, we were able to open up the ground floor uh, more with glazing uh, those windows are the uh, community room and lobby and entrance windows um, plantings also uh, in front of the building and um, Things, of course, have been evolving, and so what you see currently in the rendering as window air conditioning units uh, will be, uh, those are changing to through wall AC units, so there won't be those boxes protruding. And we'll move on to the site plan. A little small to see, um, but our building is, in fact, uh, set back from the neighboring buildings. Uh, again, that allows for a little bit of planting a little bit of breathing room, and you can see the extent of the rear yard. Moving on to a uh, closer view of the ground floor plan. Uh, again, the plantings along the front, we see the community room, which actually serves as the heirs facility. That's for the affordable independent residents for seniors. A generous lobby to support programming in that community room. Um, main entrance and then the main way through to the rear yard, landscaped. Uh, Super's unit is also at this level. And I'll turn it back over to Judy. In terms of the unit mix, um, as Fialka mentioned, we're planning on using errors. So 26 of the units will be designated for seniors. 19, including the supers unit, will be designated for families and individuals, and eight total units will be set of those aside for formerly homeless households. So six for homeless seniors, two for homeless families and individuals. So the range of incomes is from 30% to 80% of area median income. The projection as of now, um, as you know, these things are still um, in discussion, but the projection for now is that the seniors' incomes would be from approximately 19,000 to 32,000, and that the family and individuals 
um, not in the senior units would range from about 48,000 to 78,000. So that's something that um, we've been in a lot of discussions with HPD and based on our own understanding of the neighborhood um, and trying to come up with an affordability mix in addition to our consultation with your offices and with the community board. Um, in terms of the development summary, um, we've hit on most of these points already, but it's a nonprofit-led team. Um, we have a lot of experience in developing this sort of housing and are really thrilled to be partnering with Beachwood, which also has um, excellent experience doing this sort of work. It's 45 units that serve seniors, families, individuals, and formerly homeless households. We think it's a really beautiful design um, that's contextual and that connects with the surrounding neighborhood. Um, we feel that the range of affordability connects to the economics of the neighborhood. Um, we have programming and services geared toward all of the tenant populations. Um, we exceed the enterprise green community requirements and also have solar planned for the roof. Um, and then the building amenities include the community room, bike storage, outdoor recreation area, and laundry. So this is just a timeline. We did certify this project in October. We met with the land use committee of the community board last week. Um, we're here today and we will go before the full board later this week um, and then the projection for the rest of the project. Um, thank you. Thank you, so we have a few questions for you. Okay. Um, so the, the first question actually deals with the incomes and the rents. So if, if you could give us what the qualifying income range for prospective households based on the household size. Um, I think you did touch on the distribution of units by bedroom size, but could you also answer what are the anticipated rents based on the number of bedrooms? Sure. Um, this is the current proposal um, and, you know, the, there's different kind of updates each year. Um, so depending on when exactly we're able to close on our financing, and this is highly negotiated with HPD, but the current proposal is that the formerly homeless units um, will be for project-based vouchers. Um, so that's a range of units, and those will be paid at 100% of fair market rate, um, but the households will be paying 30% of their income. The senior units, the income range is from 19,000 to 32,000, and that rent range is from $377 a month to $683 a month. Um, and then the family units, the income range is from 48,000 to just below 78,000, and the rents would be about 1,070 up through 1623 per month. Um, the, we will be required to follow the HPD marketing guidelines so there would be one to two people in a studio, one to three in a one bedroom, and two to five in a two bedroom. And how long are these units required to be um, affordable? We'll have a regulatory agreement with the city, which I believe is for 40 years, um, but as Settlement Housing Fund is a nonprofit, and so we work to maintain affordability for all of our units in the long term. So given the community concerns regarding displacement, what marketing strategies would be used in the tenant selection process? Settlement Housing Fund actually has an in-house marketing team. Um, and so we do this for third parties and we also do it for ourselves. Um, we work really closely with our community partners. I think typically we distribute notices to upwards of 20 community-based organizations um, and make sure to work closely with the community board and all of the other offices. One other thing just to highlight is that Settlement Housing Fund is in the community, um, and so we have a lot of direct connections from being there. So I think we typically see over a thousand applications for each unit and um, have never had trouble filling community board spots. So would such marketing strategy start off with a financial literacy campaign? you know, to assist the residents with, who are lottery, lottery, excuse me, eligible? So we typically, um, you know, we take whatever it is that someone submits and then work with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so we 
our marketing encourages people to apply. We don't typically do financial literacy, but we ask people to submit um, you know, all of their information and then we work with them to help figure out whether they could be eligible and if so, for which units. So we have had organizations in Brooklyn actually do this extra step early to get out to teach people, so we encourage you to consider trying that for a first time. Okay, we could certainly consider that and I think we'd love to hear from your office who's done so successfully so we could talk with them about it. And the, the last question deals with sustainable and renewable energy, and I know you spoke of the solar for the roof. So the borough president is interested in promoting practices that retain stormwater uh, runoff. So what consideration has been given possibly in cooperation with the Department of Environmental Protection, the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, NYSERDA, and NYPA? Um, so first, just on the solar point, um, there had been some exchange with your office and you had asked us to consider solar and that was part of what pushed us in this direction. So uh, we appreciate that. And you had also, um, we'd talked previously about doing some sort of rain garden. Um, we had, we actually have a DEP rain garden at a different project and reached out to the same engineer who took a look at our borings and let us know that the soil permeability isn't suitable here for a rain garden. Um, so it's something that we've looked into, but um, don't think is a good match for here. Can I suggest that you go back to your engineer and talk about perhaps engineered soil, <coughs> actually scooping out the soil to a certain depth that you need for rain garden, and then replacing the soil with more appropriate soil? Yeah, we can certainly talk about it. I know that some of these things get really expensive and it's difficult with a cost-constrained project, but we'll certainly take it one step further. Um, we're also exceeding enterprise green con communities and making sure to um, incorporate sustainability to the extent we can, but yeah, I'm happy to go another round with the engineer. We should also have a conversation with BP in terms of whether there's financing on sure. their end, especially if you're in a drainage area that they're prioritizing. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That concludes the questions. Thank you. Are there any, no, are there any um, speakers who would like to speak on that calendar item that have not submitted a speaker slip? Okay, hearing none, Richard, can you please close the calendar item? Calendar item number one is closed. Calendar item number two, one nine zero four five three H A K. This application submitted by the New York City Department of Housing, Preservation and Development pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law of New York State to designate the following 13 properties as an urban development action area and an urban development action area project, 421-423 Herkimer Street, 440-444 Herkimer Street, 816 Herkimer Street, 329-331 Ralph Avenue, 335 Ralph Avenue, 35-37 Rochester Avenue and 18-22 Sudan Place and pursuant to section 197-C of the New York City Charter for the disposition of these sites to a developer selected by HPD. Such actions would facilitate the construction of seven new buildings with a total of 78 affordable home ownership units targeted to households earning 80 to 110% of area median income in Brooklyn Community District 3. Community Board 3 voted to approve this application on December 2nd, 2019. Would Felipe Cortez, the representative for this application, please state your name for the record and present the application. Good evening, everyone. My name is Felipe Cortez, and I am from the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. With me tonight is my coworker, Lynn Sen, Director of HPD Blueprint Planning, and also members of the development team working on the Rochester Side and Project. The development team includes Olga Jobe from Jobe Development Corporation, Ira Brown from the Riotwood Organization, um, and David Cunningham from DCAP Architects. As part of the ULO process, uh, we are excited to be here tonight presenting the Rochester Side and ULO application, this time to the Bureau President. The Rochester Side and Project consists of seven new well-designed and contextual buildings ranging from four to seven stories containing approximately 78 new home ownership units. The seven new buildings will be developed in 13 long-standing vacant and underutilized city-owned lots. 
To start the presentation, let me walk, to, uh, walk you through uh, tonight's agenda. I will start the presentation providing you an update on the ULR application for the Rochester Site and Project. Then I will describe the proposed land use action the ULR application is seeking. Then the development team will, uh, will then provide details of the proposed project, including affordability levels and the building designs. <laughs> we will then discuss the project timeline, and after discussing the timeline, we will have time to uh, uh, answer any questions, so please keep track of your questions as we go so we can answer them at the end. Um, the Rochester site and Euler application was certified um, on Tuesday, October 15, and we subsequently presented to uh, the Housing Land Use Committee of Community Board Number 3 on November 13, um, and then we presented to the full board of Community Board Number 3 on November, um, on December, sec on December 2nd. As stated during the introduction, the uh, Community Board Number 3 approved the project with no recommendations, and tonight, as stated, we are here to present this uh, Europe application to the Bureau of Residents. Um, the Rochester Site and Europe application is, is seeking the following land use actions. We are seeking urban development action area designation, urban development action area project approval, and the disposition of the CD on property part of the Rochester Site and project. As stated before, the proposed actions will facilitate the construction of seven new buildings ranging from four to seven stories with approximately 78 affordable home ownership units. I will now provide a, a, a brief project summary of the proposed development. Um, the Rochester Sidon project will be a 100% affordable home ownership project. Um, we are developing 13 vacant city-owned uh, uh, city lots. Um, we, the units will be affordable to households earning incomes between 80% to 110% of MI. Uh, the, units the unit mix will include 33 one-bedroom units and 45 two-bedroom units. Um, all the units will have dishwasher and washers and dryers in the units. Um, amenities will include um, um, landscape and rear yards for each of the buildings and, um, and uh, bike, uh, parking spaces for bike in, in all of the uh, in all of the buildings. Um, the proposed building will be developed under uh, enterprise green community standards, and the project will be financed under HPD's Open Door Program. The 13 CD-owned lots have been uh, grouped in seven development sites, and each of the development sites have been grouped in three clusters. The three clusters are located on the south side, on the site, on the south portion of Brooklyn um, neighborhood pets, uh, of Brooklyn Bed uh, Bedford Stuyvesant neighborhood on community board number three. Um, cluster one, the development sites surrounding areas are mostly residential. Uh, commercial and retail spaces can be found along Fulton Street. Some industrial uses can be found along uh, Atlantic Avenue. Um, the development sites in each of the clusters are well served by public transportation. For instance, cluster one is close to the C. King Troop Avenue subway station, cluster two is close to the A and C Utica Avenue station, and cluster three is one block away from the A and C Ralph Avenue subway station. Uh, each of the clusters is well served also by uh, uh, bus lines. Before, hand, before handing over the presentation to uh, the development team, I would like to say it again that we are very excited to be working uh, with, uh, with the development team on the ULOP application and in the Rochester site and project as it will create much needed <coughs> affordable home ownership units at currently vacant and underutilized city owned property. So, Good evening, I'm David Cunningham. I'm with the architecture team. We have two architecture firms collaborating on the project. In the first cluster, there are two buildings that are across the street from each other. These buildings are each five stories high. Uh, each cluster has, there's different zoning in each cluster, so the buildings are a little bit different as we move through the sites. So this. These two buildings are essentially mirror images of one another. They're five stories high. They contain 10 units. In general, for the project, we had three 
strategies that were important to us. One was to look at the surrounding neighborhood. So we looked at historic maps, we looked at historic photos, and we also, um, we picked out examples of buildings in the neighborhood that we thought were typical, but also that were um, elegant. And so we drew those, we drew those to kind of study them and use them as a basis for our own design. So the buildings typically are made of similar materials. They have brick. The openings reflect the, the historic proportions of the masonry openings that you see in the neighborhood. This pair of buildings also features a bay window above the main entrance. Um, and then here you see the, the floor plan for these two, this pair of buildings is, they're similar in that there's a units at the front of the building and units at the back of the building with stairs and elevators in the center. So one thing we were looking at was we looked at the historic neighborhood for windows and materials. The second thing that was important to us was to, and this applied primarily to this is cluster two. In cluster two, the relationship between how you enter the building and using the garden, we had some flexibility there. And so we think that there's some interesting stuff that we're doing where the sequence into the building and getting to your apartments is connected directly to either the garden or the street. Um, so here we're going to see um, there are three buildings. The first one here is on Rochester. It's, I don't have a pointer. The entrance to the building is, is at the side. And that, that entrance is exterior, and you can actually move through the building into the garden directly without entering the building. So that's available to all the residents. The other thing you'll see here is that the two buildings, the one on Rochester, which is on the left, and then it backs up to the building on Sidem. So those two buildings share a common backyard and you can, as a resident, you can go through those buildings from one street to the other. Um, again, here you see similar to the first cluster, we have brick, uh, brick facade with the traditional proportions for openings. Um, and then I'll move. So then this is on the other side, this is the Sidem Place building. And here the brick was picked precisely because of the neighboring building. There's a pretty nice neighboring building that has a, a gray iron spot brick. We found a contemporary brick that's a, a surprisingly close match to that. So this pair of buildings uses that brick. On Sidem, the building, it's a little hard to let's see. The stairs are in the middle of the plan. Both stairs are You can plain. pop the mic if you need to, Bob. Oh, yeah. You can pop the mic. And you can go to the bigger I bet you that point. Ah, that's. <laughs> now we can have some fun. Right. So the stairs are glazed. So as you're moving through the stairs, you either have the ability to connect to the street or connect to the garden. Um, and then this building has four units per, per, per floor. This is the third building, which is on Herkimer. That's on the corner. So the entrance to the building is actually adjacent to the garden. So again, everybody entering the building, the lobby is filled with daylight. You have a view out to the garden. And in similar fashion to the side of the building, the, the two stairs, are also glazed at either end. So at one end, you're looking out over the street, and the other end, you're looking over the garden. This building has um, typically three units per floor. And again, in terms of the planning, in general, we were trying to make spacious, generous apartments. So the, the floor plans, number one, the windows are oversized, so we have way more light and air than is required. So we have a lot of daylight in the buildings, in the, plan, in the apartments. Um, the apartments have very little circulation space, there's no long hallways or anything like that, so you have large living rooms, large bedrooms, and open kitchens. Um, so that brings us to the third cluster, which is on Ralph Avenue. Um, very different in that the block is largely empty. Most of the buildings on the block are gone at this point. Um, and we have, this is a, a five-story building, and then the development site seven is a Again, a different zoning district, so much higher zoning, so it's a seven-story building. This is the smaller of the two buildings. Uh, it's a little bit different from the others in that this, there's only a single stair. It has uh, windows facing over the street. The building is set back, uh, set back significantly from the street because Ralph Avenue is very busy. And then the units here are planned all the way through the building, which puts the bedrooms on the back looking over the garden. So every unit has a view of the street and a view of the garden, and the bedrooms in the rear are a little bit more private and have some more acoustic privacy from the busy street. 
And then the last development site is down the street on Ralph Avenue. There's actually a building under construction right now. That's what that one looks like. This is this, you see six stories on the street, and then there's a setback for the seventh floor. And similar to cluster one, there's a, a bay window that marks the main entrance to the building. And again here, typical to cluster one, the units are split front and back. So one unit facing the street, one unit facing the garden. Um, so, a quick summary of sustainability goals or principles. There are the standards, Enterprise Green Communities, NYSERDA, those, those are things that we're participating in. We also are using, um, all the equipment in the, in the buildings are electric, so there's no, gas in the, there's no gas use in the building. So for instance, for cooking, that makes a huge impact on the quality of the air in the apartments. We're using a variant refrigerant flow um, heat pump system for heating and cooling. We have low flow plumbing fixtures, Energy Star appliances. We also, I mentioned that we have oversized windows. The windows are um, tilt turn, which are very energy efficient and also acoustically. We're not far from the elevated tracks for the Long Island Railroad. So that type of window has a very high acoustic performance which is, you can't, you can't do it with a double hung window. We can't find a double hung window that can do that. So that's the windows, that's the windows. And then in the yards or the gardens, we're using native plant species. Um, and the last thing is we've been in discussions with a, an energy consultant about doing solar on the roof. Uh, this is, this company, it used to be called Brooklyn Power. They, they've done some innovative work with multifamily buildings and setting up sub-metering so that you can use solar panels for multiple tenant buildings. We're, we've been talking to them. They've done some, some preliminary analysis, but right now we're not sure if it's in the project or out of the project, so I'm just mentioning that. And that brings us to the proposed income mix. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Olga Job, and I'm here on behalf of Job Development. Um, as Felipe mentioned, we are targeting AMIs based on the 20, 2019 AMIs for individuals and families earning between 80 to 110 um, percent. The variations that you see on the income range are really based on household size. So for a one bedroom, the household side would be anywhere from one, one and a half to two persons. And for the two bedroom, that would be from one and a half to four persons. Um, a majority of the units are being targeted to 100% of AMI with the goal of really targeting the moderate income tier, um, the folks that really run the city, the municipal workers. Uh, we are partnering with the New York City Housing Partnership to do the marketing uh, for the sites. They will also provide, for those that are qualified, they will provide home ownership counseling, which includes financial literacy. And I don't mean to preempt your question, but to the extent that we can do uh, targeted marketing beforehand, we'll certainly reach out to community stakeholders, including the community board, local elected officials, the Brooklyn Borough President, as well as churches, to get the word out when we begin marketing the units. Good evening, I'm Ira Brown, I'm with Briarwood Organization and I'm very excited to be here to present this project. Briarwood's a 108 year old fifth generation developer, general contractor and uh, property manager and since the late 1980s has built thousands of units of affordable housing. So just want to talk a little bit about how we interact with the community and local hiring. Uh, we talk to the community board. We've actually been to the community board's land use committee a number of times before we went to the full board. And we do seek to hire locally from Bed-Stuy and the surrounding area. We follow, obviously, all the city programs, the MWBE Build-Up Program, HBD's Hire NYC, you know, working with New York One, and partnering with local workforce development and training programs. Uh, we're also members of the New York State Association for Affordable Housing, and we're one of the founders of uh, Building Skills New York. That's a training program. 
So uh, as we discussed with the community board, we would like to be able to hire people from the neighborhood. A big push, I, I know, uh, is to get the OSHA training because now with the new rules, you can't just come on the site with 10 hours, you have to have more than that. So we're very familiar with working with different community boards. We've built in uh, four of the boroughs of the city and uh, we're very excited about this project. We're open for questions now. I guess if you can bring back the slide on the, um, the breakdown with the income and the bedroom size, yeah. Yeah, so just for added clarity, um, you have 80, and 90, is that two separate tiers merge or you have to earn at least 80 but you can't earn more than 90? So it's a 7% marketing band. Um, so it would be 73 to 80, 83 to 90, 93 to 110, and 103, I'm sorry, 93 to 100 and 103 to 110. Okay, so the, the, getting, going back to the 80 and 90, 80 and 90 are two. Two separate bands. Right, so if you could break out how many of the 15 units are 80 versus how many are 90? I can't tell you that off the top of my can head, but I can certainly get back to you on that yeah. information. Of course. And, and if there was interest in accommodating more families at the 80 and or 90, is it possible that some of the hundreds could go to 110 to cross, you know, so that the project is still collecting the same revenue upon sale, but that we give more people an opportunity at the 80 and 90 because that's a place we don't get a lot of opportunity. Sure, that's something we'll definitely look at. And I know you spoke about the marketing strategies working with elected officials, other nonprofits. Um, could you talk about uh, working with the financial literacy campaign if you plan to, to do that as well? So yes, we'd, we'd, we'd be willing to do that. And like Settlement Housing mentioned before, to the extent that we can reach out and get some information from you about others that have done that successfully, we will make that linkage to the housing partnership and request that they provide that same service. And what consideration has been given to requiring that these sites be disposed with permanent affordable housing restrictions according to the shared equity model? So this will be, these will be co-ops. I'm sorry that was not included in the presentation, but these will be co-ops. Um, and as a co-op, the underlying owner is an HDFC. So by virtue of that ownership strategy, it's, I don't want to say it's permanently affordable, but it, it certainly has restrictions in terms of income. And the, the actual regulatory period is 40 years. So why not make it permanent? Because if you have an underlying situation and you're a co-op, you're eligible. So the, the tax benefit is coterminous with the regulatory agreement. The most the tax, the highest, or the maximum number of years that the tax benefit is available is 40 years through an Article 11. So the, the assumption is that the HDFC co-op would go back in year, in year 38, 39 and request an extension for their Article 11. Which would add another, well hopefully by then they'll do more than 40 years, but at a minimum it add another 40 years. Right. So, but, because one of the premises of shared equity home ownership is that the subsidies wouldn't expire, they would stay with the site forever. So like in terms of resale, it would keep it to the same AMI. So when our, in, in the model you're describing, how would the then resales be affected in terms of what AMI can be, even though it's still an affordable product, how does the AMI for each of the bands get affected in resale? So HPD, well we are in discussions with HPD regarding the resale restrictions, there will be limitations on that during that 40 year, regula regu that 40 year um, tax abatement period slash regulatory period. So the assumption is that when that's renewed, there will, those restrictions will continue because you can't necessarily confer, you can't have that restriction without having a corresponding benefit. 
So that benefit would be the additional 40 years of tax-free or right. real estate again, taxes. Like again, with the subsidies, will the subsidies? The subsidies would, would, would so, so that's not really something that we can um, provide. That is a discussion that we would have to have with HPD because it's we could only. Yeah, the preferable model is that the homeowner would not need to repay the subsidy enabling the, the sales price to be taught similar AMI than what they're paying. Even though I'm not an expert on the, on the subject, I would say that the open door term sheet establishes some, um, uh, a 2% appreciation cap per year. So at the end of the regulatory process agreement or uh, affordability period, or even before that, you will be, if you want to sell the, in this case, the co-op, uh, you will all be, all only obtain a 2% appreciation per year that you occupy the unit. Through the uh, 40 years. Excuse me? Through the 40 years. Right. right. So basically, you won't be able to sell the, the unit at whatever amount of money that you want, but it will be capped per this 2% appreciation per year. Right, and then if they were selling with a two, and four, whatever percent, would they have to pay back the subsidies or is that waived yeah. in this case? That, that, as, long as, they sell, as long as they sell to a qualified buyer based on income, they will not have to repay those subsidies. But it, so if you have, the, let's say it's up to 10%, they're there five years. So based on the sales price, why would someone be well beyond the AMI range of the qualified buyer? What controls do you have on that that we could get a family in need getting it at that price? I believe under the open door term sheet that the AMIs for the resale buyer is going to be restricted as well. HPD, we, we've received a draft of their proposed um, restrictions. It is not yet to be finalized, which is why I'm really slightly uncomfortable um, saying what they're going to propose without ha really having them. I don't even think it's gone through legal yet. I'm not sure. Um, but we can, we can send you that draft knowing that there may be additional changes. All right, we're, we're due in a little under four weeks, so. We can, I, can, I can send it to you. I just well, don't know if it's the final. I guess check with HPD what's appropriate. Yeah. And the last question deals with renewable and sustainable energy, which you touched on. Um, you talked about working with NYSERDA and possibly the feasibility of solar panels. Any um, interest in incorporating DEP rain gardens? No. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it hasn't come up before. So tonight is that we did design the landscape to, I don't, I don't know the soil properties, so I made a note that we need to check on that. Um, we did design the landscape to absorb rain and it's going to use native plants and, and those kinds of things. Um, so we'll have to look into it. And we do have, I know that we have, um, I think they're detention tanks. I kind of mix up the terms, but we do yeah, have. We're dealing with the public realm, the sidewalk area, not necessarily within the lot itself. You're talking just in the sidewalk? Yeah, that's what the rain garden, the EP rain gardens are there. Uh, you're, so you're talking. Um, are you talking about actually t taking water from the street? Correct. That kind of rain garden? Correct. Rather um, than the, okay. running down the street to the next season. Yeah. Okay. So um, we'll look into it. Oddly enough, we sh share office space with the Gowanus Canal Conservancy that's doing a rain garden pilot in the Gowanus neighborhood. And I, I, I'm hesitant because some of those things, they, they, they don't work all that well sometimes. Um, so. We will look at it for sure. I was thinking more in terms of the yards and controlling, say, the rainwater from our building. That's appreciated too, by the way. But you're really talking about the street. Yes. Huh, okay. That has not come up before. So we will, we can, we can that's easy to look at though. Great, and again, knowing our time frame, if you're able to get back to us within our time frame, even better. How's tomorrow? <laughs> okay, I'll, we'll try and get something to you by early next week. So that concludes the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Is there anyone who would like to speak that has not submitted a speaker slip on this calendar item? Okay, hearing none, Richard, if you can close this calendar item. Calendar item number two, calendar item number three, one nine zero zero one one ZMK. This application submitted by Al West Old Fulton LLC pursuant to sections 197-C and 201 of the New York City Charter for a zoning map amendment to change the eastern portion of a block bounded by Dowdy Street, Elizabeth Place, Hicks Street, and Old Fulton Street from N2-1 to M1-5. Such action would facilitate the development of an approximately 39,000 square foot five-story commercial building with retail stores occupying the cellar, ground floor, and second floor with an office space above in Brooklyn Community District 2. Community Board 2 will vote on this application on December 11, 2019. Borough President Adams will hold off on making any decisions until he hears from the board. Would Nicholas Hokins, the representative for this application, please state your name for the record and present the application. And before you go, I just want to acknowledge we now are joined by a representative from Councilmember Steve Levin of Mountain Bravo. Hi. Hello, my name is Rachel Skull. I'm an associate at Greenberg Charig. I'm joined here today by my colleagues Nick Hawkins and India Sneep. We represent All West Old Fulton LLC, the applicant seeking a city planning rezoning on a portion of block 202 in Brooklyn, um, 200 feet east of Elizabeth Street, bounded by Old Fulton Street, Hicks Street, and Dowdy Street in the Fulton Ferry neighborhood. Adam Westrick and Tommy, Tommy Lieberman are here on behalf of All West. Uh, currently, the proposed rezoning area is part of an M21 zoning district. Um, the rezoning area is approximately a quarter mile east of the East River and Brooklyn Bridge Park, across Old Fulton Street from the ramp leading to the Brooklyn Bridge, and across Hicks Street from the BQE. Our client owns 50 Old Fulton Street, which is block 14 outlined in red on this map. It's an approximately 6,600 square foot lot, improved with a one-story auto body shop. Our client purchased the property in November 2016, and the auto body shop is still operating, and their lease runs through the end of 2020. The proposed rezoning also encompasses, uh, encompasses the property to the east, lot 18, that's 60 Old Fulton Street, which is also improved with a one-story uh, one auto body shop. Uh, to walk you through the area a little bit, we brought some photos, I apologize, they're a little bit difficult to see, uh, but the images that you're seeing here in uh, images one, two, and three show the two properties. Sam's auto body is um, our client's property, and then the uh, auto body shop to the left in image number one. Um, and image four is the back of those buildings, the red brick being our client's property. And this is really what you see when you approach the Fulton Ferry neighborhood from the east uh, coming out from underneath the BQE. It's not the most welcoming unless you're <laughs> coming to get your car repaired. And we really don't think it does the neighborhood uh, much justice in its current built form. We're hoping to improve that as part of this rezoning. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, and as you can see in the background there are the watchtower buildings uh, currently undergoing their own renovations. Uh, to keep going, the narrow street you see in image number five, that's Dowdy Street behind the, the two properties. Um, Old Fulton Street there in image number six, uh, looking further west on Old Fulton Street in image number seven, you get a view of the, the Brooklyn Bridge overpass in, in images six and seven. And then image eight just showing the, the block front, um, our client's property is there on the left. There's a four story building um, just to the right. And then the Eagle Warehouse building makes up the remainder of uh, that image there. So the proposed M1, or sorry, the current, <laughs> the zoning area's current M21 zoning district allows for a maximum two FAR of commercial or manufacturing floor area, applicable height and setback regulations allow for a 60 foot or four story base at the street line, after which a building must set back 20 feet from a narrow street or 15 feet from a wide street and can continue to rise pursuant to a sky exposure plan. Uh, you see the rezoning area here, the proposed M15 zoning district would allow up to five FAR of commercial or manufacturing floor area or up to 6.5 of community facility uses. 
The applicable height and setback regulations would allow 85 feet or six stories at the street line, after which the same setback and sky exposure regulations would continue to apply. The proposed rezoning would allow for construction of a new five-story building on our client's property. An example of what that could look like is shown here and is shown here. Um, the building would contain retail uses in the cellar, ground, and second floor with offices on floors three through five above. The building would cover the full zoning lot in order to maximize the floor plates and would rise to a height of 85 feet without setback. It would contain approximately 32,965 square feet. Um, I just want to note a few things in this rendering. This is illustrative. Um, our client is waiting to see whether this rezoning is approved before they begin anything on the scale of construction drawings, but they are planning to use a mix of glass and brick in order to respect the surrounding buildings. Um, the angle of this rendering seems, or I should point out that the Eagle Warehouse building to the right there is between 88 and 98 feet tall. Uh, whereas the building shown on our property is 85 feet tall, but because of the angle of the rendering, it does look like it is the same height. We believe the resulting increase in density and permitted height would be in context with the surrounding buildings, including the Watchtower buildings and the Eagle Warehouse building. We also believe that the proposed rezoning would allow for redevelopment of the project area to create a more cohesive commercial street frontage stretching between the Brooklyn waterfront and the, and the Brooklyn Bridge Promenade and the BQE by activating this portion of the south side of Old Fulton Street. Specifically, redevelopment of the development site with active pedestrian accessible uses will create a more welcoming environment for people descending into the area from the east. The rezoning would also allow the introduction of office uses in the project area, which would help bridge the gap between Dumbo's existing office tenants and the proposed project in the Watchtower buildings. We hope to introduce uses on this site and tenants on the site that will have a vested interest in this area, just as our client does. Um, we appeared before the Community Board's Land Use Committee on November 20th, and at that meeting, we heard from the Fer Fulton Ferry Landing Association and the Dumbo Action Committee regarding concerns that they had about that application. We, we reached out to them the next day, and since then have had a uh, chance to speak with them on two occasions, uh, once with just DAC and once with FFLA and DAC. And we think those uh, meetings have been very productive and have helped us and our client understand the concerns of the local community and how we might be able to address those concerns. Um, one suggestion to which our client is amenable would be to replant trees as needed and maintain the two traffic islands in front of the proposed rezoning area on Old Fulton Street. Another is to help support lobbying efforts for a second stair at the York Street subway station and uh, involved in reconstruction of the BQE. And yesterday when we spoke with the two groups, they also proposed looking into ways to maintain the sidewalks underneath the BQE overpass on Old Fulton Street where they've noticed that garbage has been collecting. Um, we look forward to continuing conversations with both groups and the local community to hopefully finalize an agreement that will benefit the community and our client and to understand any other concerns that they may have. Thank you and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, so the, the first question actually deals with the commercial floor area. Has there been any consideration to um, provide affordable retail to possibly a local arts organization or community nonprofit? My name is Nick Hawkins. <coughs> um, we, uh, we need to speak to our clients about that, and we'll get back to you in, in writing on it. It wasn't something that we've considered yet, but it's, it's something we'll take under advice and we'll get back to you in okay. writing. So the next question deals with um, renewable and sustainable energy. Can you just speak about any um, future um, policies to promote you know, storm water rain off, um, possibly with NYSERDA, DEP rain gardens? Right, so uh, this is a very small uh, project site. It's about 6,600 square feet. It's a through lot, only 85 feet deep. So, and with commercial office use and with retail use, I mean, generally, generally the desire of the tenants is to, ha is to maximize the floor plates. So we, 
we don't have any, we're not contemplating having any, you know, open space on the zoning lot it, itself. Um, we can certainly, you know, talk <coughs> uh, internally with our design team and engineering teams to figure out uh, rainwater retention on site, how that will be handled, and the possibility of having green, white, or blue roofs along with the solar panel requirements. And, um, you, you know, we can see what we can do about plant, uh, tree pits aren't required in manufacturing districts, but we're certainly amenable to having plantings and trees in, in the sidewalks in addition to the ones that we talked about in the- And, in and the again, the rain garden talking within the sidewalk. Right. <laughs> So the last question actually deals with um, quality jobs, which is something that's very important to the borough president. Um, if you can outline what steps will be taken to ensure the inclusion and participation of minority and women-owned business enterprises and local business enterprises in the process of construction on the site for good jobs for building service workers. So we are looking into and confirming that this site would be eligible for an ICAP exemption. And when you do ICAP, uh, uh, you're required to have very rigorous outreach to NWBE programs, and we will have an answer to that question and provide it to you in writing about, about the eligibility of doing ICAM. Thank you. No more questions. Thank Thanks. you very much. So we have two speakers, uh, Amy Breedlove from the Coalition for Neighbors. Hi, I'm Amy Breedlove. I'm here tonight representing um, 12 community organizations that have banded together uh, fighting for and advocating for a transformative vision of the BQE, um, including the corridor from Vinegar Hill through Cobble Hill and Carroll Gardens, uh, including the triple cantilever. Our coalition's concerns have been raised by the proposed rezoning of 50 Old Fulton Street and the adjacent property. All of us are awaiting the proposed plan for the BQE reconstruction. Our coalition, again, which runs 12 groups along the BQE corridor from Vinegar Hill to Carroll Gardens, is calling for a comprehensive plan that transforms this corridor. This ULERP relates to property directly adjacent to the BQE and its in existing infrastructure. The future of the immediate area remains uncertain and rezoning it now shows a lack of planning on the part of the city and may unnecessarily impede any future BQE reconstruction and design needs. Approving a change to zoning for these parcels prior to adoption and approval of the comprehensive plan for the BQE would not be prudent as the redevelopment of 50 Old Fulton Street would not be included as part of a well-considered well plan. The administration should hold off on approving any change to the area zoning until the full scope of the BQE is decided including any off-ramps, parks, or other structures which may encroach upon the near the, upon or near the surrounding properties. Until that is known, the city should not approve an increase in density and height. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Gary Vanderruten, yes. uh, Board of Directors, FFL, FFLA. Thank you. Uh, I'm Gary Vanderputten, uh, a member of the Fault Ferry Landing Association, longtime resident, a resident of the Eagle Warehouse. Uh, Fault Ferry Landing Association represents the, the Fault Ferry Historic District. And I wish to point out, although this zoning doesn't fall precisely in the historic district, we consider all the buildings on that very much part of the Fulton, Fulton Ferry historic neighborhood. And so we don't, we don't think you can just step out the side of that and say, well, we're just over this line and therefore we don't have to consider everything else that's there. 
Um, I agree with everything. We certainly agree with everything was said by the prior speaker regarding the DQE. We're part of that coalition. Um, just to point out, typically when we have builders down there, Fulton Ferry Landing is very much involved early on in their discussions. We really didn't have much, we didn't know much about this until about the week before Thanksgiving. So we uh, did not have an opportunity to really see what they were proposing. Uh, so um, I know that they've reached out to us in the last week or so. We have not been able to meet with them, to sit down with them, and we intend to. One thing we're concerned with I mean, as far as the density, we're about to get 1,000 new apartments and condominiums in that area, 150 of them across the street from this. We have the Panorama, which is yet to be activated, and they, they expect four to 5,000 people. Um, just on the small scale, we have in development a bakery shop next to that, a coffee shop next, and just a little bit north of that, we have a world-class popular pizza parlor coming in. And the Brooklyn Beach Park is proposing an oyster bar on the pier. So we have plenty of changes in density coming down the street at us. And so we really caution about any further density. And I think in keeping with the prior comments, I mean, considering all that's going on, we just think that this is just the wrong time to consider this application. I think once things, you know, progress with the BQE, we might have a better idea of what would be suitable in these places. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak that has not submitted a speaker slip? Okay, hearing none, Richard, would you please close the calendar item? Calendar item number three is closed. Calendar item number four. 200059ZMK, 200060ZRK. This application submitted by 90 Sand Street Housing Development Fund Corporation, pursuant to sections 197 C and 201 of the New York City Charter for the following actions a zoning map amendment to change the block bounded by J, High, Pearl, and Sand Street from M1-6 to M1-6R10 and establish an MX-2 special mixed use district. A zoning text amendment to designate the site a mandatory inclusionary housing area and a further text change to amend the effective date of the existing MX-2 district in the Dumbo neighborhood of Brooklyn Community District 2. Such actions would facilitate the conversation of an existing building to facility containing 305 supportable housing units and 202 affordable housing units targeted to households earning 30 to 100% of area median income. The redevelopment intends to include space for community facility, commercial or light manufacturing use in its lower cellar and renovate an existing gated plaza that will be open for public use. Community Board 2 will vote on this application on December 11, 2019. Borough President Adams will hold off on making any decisions until he hears from the board. Would Judith Gallant, the representative for this application, please state your name for the record and present the application. Judith Gallant from Brian Cave, Leighton Paisner, land use attorney for the application, and I'd like to uh, introduce Brenda Rosen of Breaking Ground. I will return to discuss the land use actions when my colleagues have finished. Hi, thank you for having us here. I'm Brenda Rosen, President and CEO of Breaking Ground. Uh, Breaking Ground is a nonprofit developer of affordable and supportive housing. Next year will be 30 years old. And we have approximately 4,000 units in Brooklyn, the Bronx, Manhattan, also one in Rochester and two in Connecticut. Currently we have four operating buildings in Brooklyn and a fifth in construction right now. In addition to developing and operating supportive housing, we are the out contracted outreach provider for the city for all of Brooklyn, all of Queens and in Midtown Manhattan from uh, 23rd Street to 59th Street, river to river. So um, we work with people to, out on the streets 
to give them the services they need and bring them inside um, into permanent housing to, to become and remain stable. Uh, one of the buildings that's uh, right near 90 Sands is the Skimmerhorn in Community Board 2. This was opened in, 2000, in 2010 and uh, has 217 units. It's home to low-income community and formerly homeless residents. It is a collaboration with Breaking Ground and the Actors Fund. And uh, the Brooklyn Ballet has, has uh, utilized the community faci accessory facility space since we opened. Um, and uh, and the, built, the neighborhood around, the surrounding neighborhood around Skim Warren has, uh, has thrived uh, along with our building. So now I'm handing it over to my colleague in housing development, David Beer. Hello, I'm David Beer from Breaking Ground. So this is a site map project is in Dumbo on Sand Street, and it is bounded by J Street on the uh, east and High Street on the south. This land use, proposed land use action is um, our project, which is shown here, a 29-story hotel building, 90 Sands, and the adjacent building, which is privately owned, um, which is 175 Pearl Street. The two buildings have separate tax lots but share a single zoning lot. Um, the building is uh, in, um, has good access to the A, the C, and the F trains. It's located between the approaches to the Manhattan and Brooklyn bridges. 90 Sand Street was built by the Jehovah Witnesses in, opened in 1992, and was used by their membership who worked in the nearby headquarters and printing operations. The building has been vacant since mid-2017. Breaking Ground purchased the building uh, in August of 2018. The Property has 508 apartments. Um, we will be um, maintaining the existing configuration, which is 82% uh, of the units are studios, 18% of the units are one bedroom apartments. There'll be a mix of low and moderate income affordable community units and supportive housing for single adults exiting homelessness. 305 of the units, studio apartments, will be uh, supportive units. 202 studio and one bedroom units will uh, be for low and moderate income community uh, residents. And there'll be an on-site superintendent's units. The incomes for the community units will range, uh, will be affordable to uh, households between 30% of the area median income to 100%. There will be on-site social services. There will be a ground floor uh, and s a portion of the ground floor and cellar used for commercial or community facility use. Um, there is an existing plaza on the J Street side of the building. We will be making improvements to that and um, to activate it for public use. Our building will have a 24-7 attended lobby. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, the building will serve households with incomes ranging from 30% AMI to 100% AMI. Center for Urban Community Services um, will provide the on-site social services, which will help residents maintain stable tenancy. Um, Center for Urban Community Services is Breaking Ground's services partner at nine other buildings. As I mentioned before, we plan to create a separate 
uh, community facility or commercial space that will be about 30,000 square feet, the entry to which will be off of J Street. Um, and that space will um, be a portion of uh, the two cellars in the building as well as some ground floor space. The building uh, will have a 24-7 attended lobby that will activate the street. There will be a public plaza for public use. State-of-the-art camera system will enhance community safety. As I mentioned before, there will be commercial or community facility space in the building, so it will be a mixed-use building. And the building will have a multi-purpose uh, space on the top floor, the 29th floor, which is the current observatory that will be for both resident events as well as community and civic organization events. The construction is, um, I would uh, describe it as a modest, uh, um, uh, moderate rehabilitation. We plan to begin the construction in June 2020. The proposed work uh, includes uh, refreshing the apartment units, elevator modernization, upgrading the fire alarm system, and the heating and cooling systems, as well as creating uh, new offices for the property management and social services. We expect the renovation to take about 14 months so that occupancy would commence in the fall of 2021. I'll ask uh, Judy Gallant now to come back and uh, describe the proposed land use actions. Judy Gallant, Brian Cave. Uh, the project block is currently zoned M16, which is a light manufacturing district um, that permits commercial manufacturing and very limited community facility uses. The proposed project, which is a community facility use, is not permitted under the current zoning. So there are two land use actions that are necessary to facilitate it. The first is a zoning map amendment to rezone the site from the existing M16 to a special mixed use district that would pair at the existing M16 with an R10 um, district that would allow the use. Um, the rezoning would not change the existing FAR for commercial manufacturing and the limited number of community facility uses that are allowed. That would remain the same. Um, 10 bonusable to 12 with the provision of a plaza, a public plaza um, or an arcade. Under the proposed zoning, residential and additional community facility uses would be allowed at a maximum FAR of 12 with the mandatory inclusionary housing component for residential use. Um, the rezoning would affect just block 87, um, which consists of just two tax lots. Uh, the tax lot on which the current uh, hotel building is located and the adjacent 175 Pearl, which is an eight-story uh, office building that has seen recent investment and no changes are expected to that. It, it, has recently, it was one of the Watchtower properties as well, and it was recently um, renovated for modern office use and has two new very large tenants. Um, the second action, land use action necessary would be to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area over the uh, entirety of the block. That is required, as you know, when a, uh, a land use action increases the residential potential um, of a property. Here there is no residential potential allowed at the moment because it's manufacturing, so the rezoning requires the um, establishment of a mandatory inclusionary housing area. Here you can see the two lots that are um, affected by the rezoning. Um, the project site on the left and 175 Pearl Street on the right with the bridge extending out of it that reaches across Sand Street. The proposed zoning map on the right illustrates the appropriateness um, in our view of the proposed rezoning. As you can see, there are other MX districts in the area, particularly north of York Street, um, that permit the same mix of residential community facility and manufacturing uses as the proposed MX district. Um, in, a district, in addition, the project block is surrounded on three sides by districts that already would allow the proposed use. So to the south and west are R71 and R72 districts, 
and to the east is in our sixth district and the proposed community facility use would be allowed as of right in any of those districts. So in a sense, uh, the proposed MX district would mediate between the residential districts to the south and the M16 district that would remain in the north. It's kind of a, a nice transition because it allows both uses. Uh, as uh, Dave mentioned, the site does have a 7,632 square foot existing public plaza um, and uh, changes to that plaza to make it more inviting and open to the public will necessitate a chairperson certification. Um, that is proceeding on a separate track than the Euler. It's taking a little longer um, and city planning allowed them to go separately. Uh, Breaking Ground has agreed to return uh, with that application to the community board to share the design when it is available and progress to a point of, of some agreement between city planning um, and the applicant. We'll take any questions that you may have. So in terms of supportive services, I know you mentioned um, working with the Center for Urban Community Services on as a supportive services on site. Do those services apply solely to the supportive housing residents or are they also intended to be available to the rest of the building's residents or the community at large? Uh, they'll be um, for all of the tenants in the buildings, uh, formerly homeless and low and moderate income. The next question deals with marketing strategies. So what tenant selection process will be used to ensure high participation from community district two? So Breaking Ground also, similar to settlement housing, um, does our own marketing and leasing for Breaking Ground properties and others. Um, so we will be employing a range of strategies to reach out to um, all of the local electeds, local police precincts, schools, churches, um, other CB2 organizations, um, in addition to the, the advertising that we'll do. Um, we fully expect that we'll receive probably close to 200,000 applications for the 200 affordable units. We also ask that because you have small units perfect for seniors because you have a bunch of AMIs mm -hmm. that are 30, 40, maybe 50, that outreach go into the realm of seniors. Absolutely, yeah, we'll do specific outreach to seniors. And I guess piggybacking on, the, on that particular question, um, would such marketing strategy start off with a financial literacy campaign to uh, assist uh, lottery eligible uh, residents? We haven't done that to date. I mean, we, we meet with groups as, as requested to go through the process and walk people through how to sign on to Housing Connect, et cetera. Um, we can do that and do more if, um, if we can, again, be connected with, with those services or find them ourselves. We have no problem meeting with any groups. Um, we, just, we just have to find out the details. Yeah, there's been several active in the downtown Portland area. Okay. Well, that would be great. And in connection with the commercial floor area, has there been any consideration to using, um, providing affordable retail or to any you know, cultural institutions, or nonprofits? So our, most of our outreach to date regarding the um, commercial space has been to food production operators because the lower seller which would be part of this uh, commercial space is a 20,000 square foot commercial kitchen um, the witnesses um, uh, provided uh, three meals a day 365 days a year for the residents of the building as well as um, other uh, church members that worked in the area. The, the dining hall um, had uh, occupancy of, uh, of 1,100 
people, so they served a lot of meals. We have, sh we have talked to and shown the space to um, probably a half a dozen food production operators, uh, a few of which prepare uh, lunches for charter schools and private schools. Um, most of them said they would be willing to participate in, uh, with us in a job training program for our residents. Um, the, the hurdle that we have yet to successfully negotiate is no one operator can use that entire space. In fact, it would probably mean three operators at a minimum sharing that space, and that's, um, that, that's a complicated arrangement that we haven't really figured out yet. But uh, in answering, in response to your question, that has been uh, our focus today, food production operators. And, and the last question actually deals with renewable and sustainable energy, which is very important to the borough president. Um, has there been any consideration to work with uh, NIPA, NYSERDA, and in, uh, incorporating DEP rain gardens? So, as I understand it, uh, rain gardens are, um, are, are installed over permeable soil, and, and the site doesn't have any permeable soil. It's completely built out between the building and the plaza. The plaza is directly over um, a portion of the, uh, the cellars, so um, uh, I, I don't, we don't have plans to put in a rain garden. So you would not need to do an updated builder's payment plan to the occupancy? No. That concludes our questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have one speaker, Elizabeth Adams, Legislative Director, Council Member Stephen Levin. Hi, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Adams. I'm here on behalf of Council Member Stephen Levin to voice support uh, for the project for 90 Sands uh, for the Breaking Ground proposal. Good evening, I'm proud to announce my support for the rezoning of 90 Sand Street, a much needed supportive housing project for the district. Supportive housing is permanent affordable housing paired with wraparound services designed to help, maintain, help people maintain their homes for the long term. Tenants are provided with individual, individualized on-site care, including case management, job training, and mental health and, mental and substance abuse counseling too often missing in other places in their lives. I'm especially pleased to see this project being led by Breaking Ground. Breaking Ground has a strong track record as a nonprofit developer of affordable and supportive housing in the area and has helped thousands of homeless New Yorkers move into permanent and safe and secure housing. This project is critical to achieving our city's goals of moving New Yorkers out of homelessness, of which there are approximately 80,000 New Yorkers citywide currently and onto a path of housing and long-term care. Breaking Ground has been a key partner citywide in these efforts and has helped improve neighborhoods and helped create affordable housing that saves taxpayer dollars. As a supportive housing development, 90 Sand Street will provide direct case management services, as we heard earlier, and access to mental health providers for its residents. We all know how vital mental health care is to a person's well-being and is even more so for those who face unstable housing or have experienced significant trauma in their lives. The integrated service model approach enables people to connect to the programs that are right and unique for them, helping them to lead their best lives. We need all of us to come together to help solve our homelessness crisis in our city. And I look forward to seeing this project move forward and working with Breaking Ground and with all of our community members and partners in doing so. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak that has not submitted a speaker slip on this calendar item? If not, Richard, could you please close this calendar item? Calendar item number four is now closed. The hearing on these items is now closed. Thank you for participating in this public hearing. 
Borough President Adams will review the applications we heard today and will soon submit his recommendations to the City Planning Commission. Borough President Adams would like to take this opportunity to remind you that the City Planning Commission will hold a public hearing on these items. The hearing is now adjourned. Borough President Adams would like to remind those viewing on the website that timely comments can be submitted by email to askeric at brooklynbp.nyc.gov. Thank you.